and they are in this state where they are now trying to figure out how they are going to survive. And what has happened is Ruth, the younger of, of the two women, has begun to work in the field of a man named, named Boaz. And Boaz has been very generous because at first she was simply gleaning in the fields. She was going along behind the workers, picking up whatever was left behind so that she could take it home to her mother-in-law and they would have something to eat. But after inquiring a bit about her, Boaz allowed her to be with the women in, who were working in his fields. And that she didn't just have to follow behind, but she could work alongside them and be able to provide for her mother-in-law. But we all know something about harvest seasons is eventually they're going to come to an end. Eventually it's going to be the time when the fields aren't ripe any longer, that, that there's going to be a time that every bit of the grain that has been, um, has been threshed is going to be taken and milled and put into silos and distributed. And so this work that Ruth has before her has a short window left. And that is a threat to the security of these women. Because once again, they're going to have to wonder, how can they, how can they survive? This is a time when the, if you didn't have a husband, if you didn't have sons especially, a family to be part of, you didn't have any hope or a future. And so it's, it's a critical time in this part of the story. And so Naomi, the wise mother-in-law, says to Ruth, my daughter, shouldn't I seek security for you so that things might go well for you? Now it's interesting that she uses this word security. It's actually a, a Hebrew word called manawak. It's the same word that Ruth and Na that Naomi uses with Ruth in the first chapter of this book. It actually, in chapter 1, verse 9, is used, and instead of security, it means a place of rest. So there's this sense of security and rest going hand in hand. And as you can imagine the journey that these two women have been on together, all of their time traveling on foot, all of their time working, and all of the grief that they've carried, all of the pain that they have borne, now there is this time of hope for security and rest. And so Naomi recognizes that the man who owns the field, this Boaz is one of the relatives of her family, her husband's family. And that means that he's what's called a kinsman redeemer. Redeemer, we know that word, right? What does a redeemer make us think of? Christ. But this kinsman redeemer is someone who is going to come and take a woman into his household. It's the job of the kinsman redeemer to marry someone and then bear children for the deceased family members so that that lineage goes on. And we talked about that the very first week, that this is going to be an important family tree that is birthed through these encounters. But right now, we're thinking about this moment when Ruth, who has been working so faithfully who's been providing for Naomi, um, she has to come to this point of the story where she's very intentional about everything that she does. One wrong move, and her entire reputation could be destroyed. They could think of her as some sort of low woman. Or she could be cast out of even the working group. They could say, we want nothing to do with this woman, and then there's no sense of security, no sense of rest. Where would they be? Ruth is at this place where she has to be very intentional, and she has to be very proactive, though, because she can't just sit back and look cute and hope that Boaz is just going to notice her. 
Naomi is giving her very clear instructions about how she is going to win her man. And it's things that we all think are important. Bathe, <laughs> put on some nice clothes, put on some perfume, and then go down to the threshing floor. The threshing floor is a very important image in scripture because it's not just about the actual work of winnowing the barley. I mean, we know that that's an important job agriculturally, especially in this time and era when it wasn't done by machines. It was all done by hand. It wasn't until the late 17th, maybe early 18th century that they started using machines in this process. But the threshing floor was where everything was going to take place. But if we think about it, in scripture, there's lots of imagery about separating the grain, the wheat from the chaff, right? Allowing the weeds to grow with the grain. And then there's going to come a time of judgment. And so if you think about this threshing floor image, this moment in time when Ruth is going to have to use all her feminine wiles and approach her kinsman redeemer, it's that moment of judgment in a lot of ways for her. Is she going to be accepted? Is she going to be found worthy? Is this redeemer, this man, going to be honorable to her? Is he going to reject her? There's so much. And could you imagine how nerve-wracking and how, how anxious she must have been at this moment as she's going to the threshing floor? It's really this great moment of exposure where everything could be lost or gained. She has everything to lose at this point, but also everything to gain. She's in a very vulnerable position. Social researcher Brene Brown talks about belonging. And she talks about how every time there is an act of courage, it involves vulnerability. And what does she mean by that? She says that there's always uncertainty and risk and emotional exposure. Every time you have to be courageous, there's also that balance of having to be vulnerable to put yourself out there. And Brown said that um, it is true in every circumstance, that she was teaching this concept to a group of men who were part of special forces units in the military, because all of them were like, oh, no, we're never vulnerable. We are courageous. We do the job. And she said, no, but you've got to think about it. There's always the uncertainty. There's always, is there not always the risk? And even if you're trying not to be emotional at that moment, there still is that emotional leap you have to be willing to take. It's that moment where you say, I'm going to do what I have to do, do or die. That is this moment of exposure. And so here we find Ruth in this vulnerable place, going to that threshing floor at night when nobody else can see, and doing a very sexy move, apparently, which is she just <laughs> uncovers his feet and lies down. <laughs> yeah, this is, this is R-rated stuff right here. His feet are out on the covers. And she's I'm lying the down there. Right. And then at some point, in the night, he kind of rolls over and says, whoa, whoa who's down there? <laughs> and there's Ruth. And he recognizes um, wh who she is and what is happening here. She said, he says, who are you? She replies, I'm Ruth, your servant. Spread out your robe over your servant because you are a redeemer. Such a vulnerable place. He could have taken advantage of her. He could have done anything he wanted to to her and with her. I mean, she had no status at all. No status. She was lower than a slave at this point. But Boaz is a righteous man. 
He even recognizes that although he is a redeemer, there is another relative who's even closer. So he wants to do right by this process. And so he's promising Ruth that the next morning he's going to go and sort all of this out and that he would redeem her, but he wants to make sure that the other guy who's first in line doesn't get shorted. And so he tells her to open up her coat and he pours some barley into it for her to take back to Naomi so that they would have food. And he promises that he's going to settle all of this. Stay the night. In the morning, if he'll redeem you, good, let him redeem. But if he doesn't want to redeem you, then as the Lord lives, I myself will redeem you. So lie down until morning. We're going to hear more about how this story unfolds next week. But what I want us to focus on tonight is that risk, that risk that Ruth was willing to take to listen to everything Naomi told her to do, to follow each and every one of those steps. But for this relationship to unfold, it took that courage from her. It took her willingness to be vulnerable. And that's the thing about relationships. Whenever we're trying to form a relationship where we're truly sharing life with another person, there comes that moment when you have to expose yourself you have to be willing to let them in a little bit more. You have to be willing to face rejection or be willing to be turned away. But in order for any great relationship to begin, somebody has to take that step to be brave and courageous and trust that the emotional exposure is going to be worth it, pain or not. Gaining everything or losing everything. But sometimes we have to be willing to take that step. So think about the relationships that you may be on the verge of or may, relationships that you're a part of. How is it that you can take the next step to go deeper with someone in your life that you're sharing faith with or just trying to engage as a friend with or maybe even trying to become involved romantically with? Every great story of care and concern and love for one another risks this place of vulnerability. And we have to trust the leading and guiding of our Lord as we enter into these places to open up our hearts and open up our lives and be willing to go into those places of uncertainty. I give thanks to God for these stories and stories like this one. And I remind us that what we're seeking most in here is security and rest. And a lot of that comes from knowing that even if we're vulnerable, we are doing what God is calling us to do, being the people God calls us to be, and risking relationships with one another the way that Christ calls us to as we care for our neighbors and love all the Lord and our neighbors with our heart, mind, soul, and strength. Thanks be to God, who is our great Redeemer from this great family tree. Amen.